Well, good morning, church. Welcome to our next daily Bible reading. Let me go ahead and open us up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning and this time that we have in your word. Guide us by your spirit. Help us to understand and to grow in our wisdom that you may be glorified. And we pray these things in the name of your son, Christ Jesus. Amen. And as we look at our passage for this morning, we're looking at the book of Haggai, which is two chapters, and then Zechariah chapter 1, Psalm 138, 1 John chapter 2. So we're actually breaking from the book of Ezra um, as we are proceeding forth. The effort here, the attempt here by um, these devotionals is to kind of bring us um, to, to kind of go in a kind of chronological order. And Haggai is one of the minor prophets, and he would have been one of the prophets during the time that the um, return of the exiles to Jerusalem was occurring. And so you may remember when we finished off the last chapter of Ezra, what we saw was um, that the building had stopped. The building of the temple had stopped by an order from King Artaxerxes. And so we look at Haggai and we're going to see that this is being addressed by Haggai directly. And we see a rebuke from the Lord to the Israelites, starting in Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, this people says the time has not come, even the time of the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Then the word of the Lord came to Haggai, saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? So we see here that the Israelites had built up their own homes, but they went ahead and stopped. And we can understand why they stopped. It was the order from King Artaxerxes. And yet, really what they should be trusting in is um, the Lord and his purposes for them. Verse 5, Now therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your waves, you have sown much and harvest little. You eat, but there is not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there is not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, and no one is warm enough, and he who earns earns wages to put into a purse with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and rebuild the temple, that I may be pleased with it and glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, it blows it away. Why, declares the Lord, because of my house, which lies desolate, while each of you runs to his own house. So he's pointing out the fact that the Israelites have returned, but they're not fruitful. They're not prospering. And the Lord is saying the reason why you're not prospering is because you have neglected the house of the Lord. Therefore, because of you, the sky has withheld its dew and the earth withheld its produce. I called for a drought on the land, on the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil and what the ground produces, on men, on cattle, and on all the labor of your hands. And we see that the Israelites end up responding in obedience. Verse 12, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai, the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people showed reverence to the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke by the commission of the Lord to the people, saying, I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord, their host, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. And then we go to Haggai chapter 2, and we see the Lord's promise over this temple. On the 21st of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? But now take courage, Zerubbabel declares the Lord. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and all you people of the land, take courage, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. So the temple, even at this point, um, looked like nothing compared to the prior temple in all its glory. But the Lord is assuring them to keep working on it. He is with them. 
Verse 5, as for the promise which I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and they will come with the wealth of all the nations. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. And then in verse 10, we see that the Lord gives a promise of future blessings. Verse 10, on the 24th of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest for a ruling. If a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread with his fold or or cooked food, wine, oil, or any other food, will it become holy? And the priest answered, No. Then Haggai said, If one who is unclean from a corpse touches any of these, will the latter become unclean? And the priest answered, It will become unclean. Then Haggai said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. But now do consider from this day onward, before one stone was placed on another in the temple of the Lord. From that time, when one came to a grain heap of twenty measures, there would be only ten. And when one came to the wine vat to draw fifty measures, there would be only twenty. I smote you and every word of your hands with blasting wind, mildew, and hail. Yet you did not come back to me, declares the Lord. Do consider from this day onward, from the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, from the day when the temple of the Lord was founded, Considered, is the seed still in the barn, even including the wine, uh, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree? It has not borne fruit, yet from this day on I will bless you. So the Lord points out that they had not been prospering because of their failure to build this house, but now the Lord is promising from this day forward, I will bless you, and that is a result of them rebuilding the temple. And verse 20, then the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai in the 24th day of the month saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the thrones of the kingdom and destroy the power of the kingdoms and of the nations. I will overthrow the chariots and their riders, and the horses and their riders will go down, every one by the sword of another. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord. And so we have this vision that the Lord is going to bring judgment upon all these nations. But not only that, he's going to take their riches and bring them to Israel and make Zerubbabel a signet ring. Now, this would almost seem to imply that Zerubbabel was their Messiah or their Savior and that he would be the one to bring the kingdom. But obviously, looking back in history, we know that's not the case. And so a signet ring, just as um, just as a way of uh, edification. It's a sign of a royal authority or personal ownership. I have the notes written here. And Zerubbabel is actually mentioned in Matthew chapter 1. When we start the New Testament, the very first chapter starts with the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that Zerubbabel is mentioned. And so really what the Lord is promising Zerubbabel by making him a signet ring is that the Davidic line is continued now through Zerubbabel. Earlier on in Jeremiah chapter 22, verses 24 to 25, the Lord had removed uh, the uh, Jeconiah, I believe. It was Jehoiachin, sorry, Jehoiachin, as uh, being the signet ring of the Lord. And now Zerubbabel, who's the grandson, has now been kind of restored as that signet ring. And so the line of David now continues forward. So this promise was not directly to Zerubbabel, but the promise would be to one of his offspring. And Zerubbabel is being mentioned as, as kind of symbolic of that. And then from there, we'll go to Zechariah chapter 1. Zechariah is a book that is rich in prophecy, similar to Daniel that we read um, last week. And so some of the prophecy gets very detailed, and we're just going to go ahead and read through it. And it's something that we can study at a later time or you can study in your own personal study to see how it all um, lines up with um, what's going to come in the future. But certainly there are prophecies, very important prophecies concerning the Messiah 
in Zechariah. And so as we look at, as we look at Zechariah chapter 1, we see in verse 1, starting in verse 1, the Lord's going to call Israel to return to him. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, um, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, saying, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return now from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not listen or give heed to me, declares the Lord. And so we see this ongoing testimony of the disobedience of the Israelites. In verse 5, your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your fathers? Then they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts purposed to do to us in accordance with our ways and our deeds, so he has dealt with us. And then we see the Lord establishing his patrol. Verse 7, on the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, as follows. I saw at night, and behold, a man was riding on a red horse, and he was standing among the myrtle trees which were in the ravine with red, sorrel, and white horses behind him. Then I said, My Lord, what are these? And the angel who was speaking with me said to me, I will show you what these are. And the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are those whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. So they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, We have patrolled the earth, and behold, all the earth is peaceful and quiet. And in verse 12, we see the Lord's promise of compassion for Judah and Jerusalem. Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no compassion for Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, with which you have been indignant these seventy years? The Lord answered the angel who was speaking with me with precious words, comforting words. So the angel who was speaking with me said, Proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and Zion. But I am very angry with the nations who are at ease, for while I was only a little angry, they furthered the disaster. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I will return to Jerusalem with compassion. My house will be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts, and a measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem. Again proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, my cities will again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. And then we see a vision of this overthrow of the horns. Verse 18, Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there were four horns. So I said to the angel who was speaking with me, What are these? And he answered me, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. I said, What are these coming to do? And he said, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man lifts up his head. But these craftsmen have come to terrify them, to throw down the horns of the nations who have lifted up their horns against the land of Judah in order to scatter it. Now, as I have written in these notes, there are multiple possibilities for these four horns. Um, the first is that this could be Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, and Medo-Persia. These are the nations that actually brought the, um, the Israelites into exile, that scattered them across the nations. Um, the second possibility is that these are the four nations who have ruled over them, uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome. And the third possibility is that these are symbolic of enemies coming from all different directions. We won't sort through that all that here. I just want you to know that um, this is one that is debated by the commentaries. And verse and now we get to Psalm 138, and we see this psalm opening up with thanksgiving and praise. Uh, a psalm of David, I will give you thanks with all my heart. I will sing praises to you before the gods. I will bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word according to all your name. On the day I called, you answered me. You made me bold with strength in my soul. And then we see that the nations will praise him. All the kings of the earth will give thanks to you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. 
and they will sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is exalted, excuse me, looks like we lost signal. My apologies for that disruption. Um, still working with uh, this new camera that I've got, but it's the connections, and I think it's a bad cable, so I'm going to get that replaced. We kind of saw that this past Sunday in the Sunday service as well. Um, but as we look at this psalm, once again, verses 4 through 6, really talk about the fact that the nations will come to worship the Lord. And just another reminder that all throughout the Old Testament are future promises, not just for Israel, but that all the nations would come and glorify him. And then as we look at uh, verse 7, we, sees that, we see that the Lord is going to deliver the psalmist himself. This is David. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch forth your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will accomplish what concerns me. Your loving kindness, O Lord, is everlasting. Do not forsake the works of your hands. And then we come back to the New Testament, 1 John chapter 2. And we see this emphasis on upon walking in obedience uh, to Christ. Verse 1, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And by the way, very interesting. Uh, verse 1, he repeats this phrase every once in a while that I am writing these things to you so that, and uh, he's going to mention that multiple times um, in this book. And this phrase gives us a picture of the purpose that John had in writing these letters and really to come together with an overall purpose of this letter you want to put together each time that he says I am writing these things to you so that and put them together and you'll find the purpose of John and to continue on and if anyone sins we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ the righteous and he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for those of the whole world by this we know we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. And these are very similar words of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, recorded through the Gospel of John chapters 14 through 16 as well. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says, he abides in him, ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. And so that is a expectation for us to walk like the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have this commandment that is both an old and a new commandment. Verse 7, Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. And verse 8, on the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. And the commandment really is to love one another. And you find this commandment to love one another going all the way back to the law of Moses. But Jesus, when he brought it forth, he issued it as a new command, not a command that not new in the sense it's never been heard before, but really it's been reinstated by Jesus as being one of high priority amongst the disciples to each other. And verse 9, the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And then we see John's purpose once again. Verse 12, I am writing to you little children because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. Now, let me stop right there, and I have a little note written up of there. There are three groups being referenced here, and there's a couple of views of these three groups. One is that when he refers to the little children, he's referring to everyone in this letter. And the reason why some people have come to that interpretation is that in verse 1, he addresses his audience as my little children. The second view is that, um, <clears throat> is that he is writing to three different groups of maturity, um, little children being those who are perhaps barely saved and have a just a very basic understanding of the gospel and, and the word. And then there are fathers who are mature in their faith. And then there are young men who have been in the faith and are showing signs of growth, but still have room to grow. 
And I would probably lean uh, towards the idea that these are three groups of, uh, of different levels of maturity. And so verse 12, I am writing to you little children because your sins have been forgiven to you for his name's sake. And anyone who has been saved would understand at least that much. Verse 30, 13, I am writing to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. And I am writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you children because you know the father. I have written to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. And then verse 15, he goes on to say, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. And so we have this constant temptation to fall into the ways of the world, to give in to the lust of the world, and to start acting like the world. And so very clearly we see this commandment from John to resist that. And then verse 18, children, it is the last hour, just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many, ant many Antichrists have appeared. And this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they are not of us. And this I point to as an important verse um, because many people um, falsely believe that just because someone claims to know the Lord Jesus Christ that they are saved. Um, well, if they truly have put their faith in Christ, they are saved and they are safe in the arms of God forever. But sometimes we come across people that walks away from the church and in this case is referring to Antichrist. But I don't believe that this is only limited to Antichrist. It could, be, it could be anyone who had claimed to be part of the faith, but then walked away. Verse 19 goes to show that they, were, they, they went out from us because they were never truly of us. And if they were of us, they would have remained. So the idea that um, those who walked away, it wasn't that they were Christians and then lost their salvation, but they walked away to show that they were never truly Christian to begin with. And then John talks about the anointing of the Spirit, starting in verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, just as, as, just as it has taught you, you abide in him. Now, sometimes people will take these verses and show that, see, we don't need any pastors or teachers to teach us the word of God. We have the Holy Spirit. And as long as you have the Holy Spirit and you have the Bible, you have everything you need to learn the word of God. Well, that's not really the point here. The point here is that you don't need false people, false teachers, these antichrists to come and teach you because you have the spirit and you know the truth just by going to the truth. But it is God himself that actually provides the church with teachers and pastors. We saw that in Ephesians chapter four. You can look at verse 11. God is the one who has raised up these shepherds to teach and preach, but they teach and preach from the word of God. And as they teach and preach the word of God, you have the spirit and you have the means to be able to verify what it is that you hear. What you don't need are people from the outside coming to teach you something that is contrary to what the Bible itself teaches. And so as we go on and we finish this chapter, verse 28, now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. 
If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. That brings us to the end of our reading for this morning. Let me go ahead and close us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for these words. Thank you for your scriptures. Thank you for your blessings. We pray that you continue to protect and guide the church of your son, Jesus Christ. And may you be glorified by the result. And we pray these things in his name, Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you once again for joining us this morning. And I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow morning for the next daily Bible reading. Have a wonderful rest of the day and God bless.